Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining today's presentation, Paying for Quality, What is the Impact on Health Equity, Part 2, brought to you by the National Center for Primary Care's Health Information Technology Policy Center at Morehouse School of Medicine. You can learn more about the Health IT Policy Center by visiting healthpolicymatters.org and follow along on Twitter at, at TCC underscore HIT policy. And just a little bit about the National Center for Primary Care. CNCPC is a national resource for encouraging doctors to pursue primary care careers, for making primary care practice more effective, and for supporting primary care professionals serving in underserved areas with a focus on access, effectiveness, and equity. So also a little bit about the Health IT Policy Center. The Health IT Policy Center focuses on informing policy about the impact of health IT on health disparities and implementing health IT policies and research findings that advance health equity into practice. Today's webinar objectives include to distinguish between the concepts of improving overall quality and eliminating health disparities in underserved populations, identifying provisions of the macro regulations that will advance health equity, and to discuss missed opportunities that future research and policy making may address. And our presenters for today are Ms. Megan Douglas. She is the Associate Director of Health Information Technology at the National Center for Primary Care here at Morehouse School of Medicine, and Dr. Jeffrey White. He is the founder of White's Pediatric in North Georgia, and he's also the board member of the Georgia Health Information Technology, I'm sorry, the Georgia Health Information Network. Now I'd like to turn it over to Ms. Douglas to get us started. Megan? Thank you, and thank you everybody for being here today. Um, just want to give a quick disclaimer about the funding support for this webinar and the project that we will be talking about. It's funded by the NIH National Institute of Health, National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities. The views and information presented here are solely those of the presenters and not the NIH. So a quick overview of what we'll be discussing today. We'll go over the significance of health equity and why it is important to identify health equity and, and, and the impact of MACRA on health equity. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the background of the MACRA law. And then the core of the webinar is actually going to be a discussion between myself and Dr. White. And we will talk a little bit about the provisions of the final rule for MACRA and the implications of this policy on small, rural, and underserved providers and FQHCs. We'll talk a little bit about technology and data and then we'll also discuss the future of MACRA and other um, pay for performance policies. So why is health equity important and what are the implications of, um, of the MACRA policy for advancing health equity? Well, we know that health disparities have significant costs on the health system as financial costs and also on years of quality life, illness, premature death, and disability. Um, over a three-year period, a study showed that health disparities were estimated to cost $230 billion in direct costs and more than a trillion dollars in indirect costs. And we know that quality outcomes are basically, you know, having worse outcomes and less access uh, is, is part of the definition of health disparities. So we know that we have evidence of health disparities across racial and ethnic minority populations, LGBTQ individuals, people with disabilities, um, those who live in poverty and rural areas, those with mental and behavioral health issues, and a host of other categories that have been associated with health disparities. And it's important to also note that there is a lot of intersection across these different categories. And people, individuals actually identify across a number of these and the impact of that on having worse health outcomes and um, potentially shorter life expectancies is significant for policy making. And because MACRA focuses on one of the major focuses of MACRA is improving quality. It's important for us to identify and to be able to distinguish improving healthcare quality for all does not necessarily translate to reducing disparities for racial and ethnic minorities and other underserved populations. So we have seen over the years the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality tracks improvement in healthcare outcomes and also tracks 
changes in health disparities over time. And we have seen from this report that in a number of different ways, overall quality is improving um, pretty significantly. And this is from the 2015 report um, that showed in person-centered care, patient safety, healthy living, effective treatment and care coordination, um, we are making improvements in clinical quality in those categories um, at higher rates than, than we're seeing no change or worsening in those categories. But then when you look at the disparities that we're seeing, we are not seeing similar types of improvements there. So this is, was, is a real um, you know, important indicator for us to identify that even though MACRA is focused on improving quality, we need to understand how this program um, impacts health disparities as well, because those do not necessarily mean the same thing. So we do know, though, on the other side of that, that there are effective strategies for eliminating health disparities. And I just listed here a number of um, different studies that have shown elimination or reduction of health disparities for uh, child vaccination rates. We have seen some pretty effective interventions around HIV prevention, um, in effective interventions for people with disabilities, um, LGBT groups, and um, lo just lots of different outcomes listed here. And then the common themes that we really see across these effective interventions are that health equity is prioritized and that the interventions actually target the reduction of disparities. So that's, that's important for us as we're looking at MACRA to understand that those interventions that have been effective have, have actually been effective because they were trying to be effective in that way. Um, so we are going to have a really interesting discussion today and I think that the listeners are going to continue to hear over and over and over again within this discussion that there is a pretty significant gap between policy and practice. My role here and the, the my, my work really focuses on the policy side, so you're going to hear a lot more high level, what does the language of the actual law say around health equity directly, and then what impacts can we look at uh, more indirectly from the law. But then we're also going to have Dr. White here who will talk about the practical implications for how we might be implementing this law, and, and if we are focusing on health equity, how providers might be able to do that, or what challenges they might face in their practices to do that. So just a quick reminder of a timeline for MACRA. The MACRA law, which also, by the way, I should have spelled out the acronym earlier, Medicare Access and CHIP Reauthorization Act was signed by President Obama on April 16, 2015. The proposed rule to implement MACRA was published by CMS on May 9th of 2016. And just for those who may or may not have um, been on this webinar, the TCC hosted a webinar when that proposed rule came out on June 2nd of 2016 that really um, broke down the proposed rule and that's where the core of our analysis that we'll discuss some of that today came from um, was during that, that webinar and we also got a lot of feedback from our listeners during that webinar as to how the proposed rule provisions could impact health equity. The public comments were due in June of 2016 and the final rule was published in November. So just also a reminder of what the MACRA law is comprised of. And the uh, MACRA law is really made up of two different programs here. We're talking about the Merit-Based Incentive Payment System, which is also known as MIPS. And then there is the Advanced Payment Models. Uh, the majority of clinicians are going to fall under the MIPS program at the beginning of MACRA. And there are four different components that will make up a composite performance score for clinicians who fall into the MIPS program. So the four components are quality, cost, advancing care information, which is the health IT component, formerly meaningful use, and improvement activities, um, 
full name clinical practice improvement activities, but we'll refer to them here as improvement activities. Um, and basically with this program, clinicians will report on activities for each of those four components, and based on their performance, they'll be given a composite performance score, which will determine whether their reimbursement will be increased or decreased. So it's important to know that today we're going to focus primarily on MIPS. We may talk a little bit about some of the advanced payment models, um, but sig more significantly for us, um, and, and talking about the health equity and smaller um, practices, we're going we're gonna to cover MIPS more. And then it's also important to note that in the final rule of MACRA, quality was um, pushed to 60%, but then that also eliminated resource use or the, or the cost component for that first year. So that was a change from the um, proposed rule. And now we're going to get ready to go into the discussion, but I wanted to start with a polling question to assess who we have in our audience right now. Um, so I understand with our policy webinars, a lot of times we don't have um, all, all clinicians, so if this question is not relevant to you, then, then answer uh, D. But do you plan to participate in the quality payment program? Uh, a would be yes as a MIPS eligible clinician, B, yes, as part of an advanced payment model. C, not eligible due to low volume, or if you're an FQHC or some other uh, rural health clinic, you might fall under that category as well. Um, or D, no, I am not a health care provider. We'll wait just a couple more seconds. Okay, so we're going to close the poll out. Um, it actually looks like we don't have any providers, at least, who have identified themselves on this um, webinar, which probably means we have more policy-focused, academic-focused, or public health people on here. But I think it's important for those audiences to understand the both the policy level and the practice level. Um, so you know, you'll definitely get a sense for both of those throughout the rest of the presentation. And we're going to go into the discussion now, but before we do, I want to hand it over to Dr. White to introduce himself and, and talk a little bit about the perspective that he's going to be presenting from today. Thank you, Megan. I'm Dr. Jeffrey White. I am a pediatrician, as mentioned, uh, from North Georgia. I have practices in the cities of Dalton, Chatsworth, and Calhoun. Um, I am a person who is in the practice of clinical medicine, have always felt that the most important thing to do is to take care of your patients. Um, in order to do that, you, in the United States of America, you had to make sure that you met or are able to meet all regulations that apply to the care of patients. So it's always my philosophy to try to stay ahead of the government. Uh, I always want to do more for my patients than what the government would ever require of me. And as a result of that, you might wonder why a pediatrician is talking about macro. Well, simply because and my interest in, in what the government has to do about medicine, I realize they set the tone of what's going to happen in the future. So I always try to stay aware. And in, uh, back in 2015, when I realized this <clears throat> law had been passed, I um, immediately began to investigate it and realized it, had, it would have significant impact on health care in the United States of America. And uh, it, was, it was sort of real to me because it was a, it, it was a nonpartisan bill. Um, with a great vote of at least 94 yeses in the Senate and only 34 no's in the House. So it was significant to me at that time in lieu of who was actually served as president that we recognized that this is something that really meant a change in the future. So I began investigating because I realized whatever happens in Medicare will happen in Medicaid eventually. And so if I'm going to stay ahead of the curve, I need to know exactly what's going to happen <laughs> to Medicare. But also there's a portion of it, the CHIP Reauthorization Act, was it pediatric, uh, a marked pediatric interest. So having done that, I made sure that I stayed abreast of what was going on and had the opportunity to present a talk about that in the fall of that year, surprising many that had never heard of MACRA. So um, I think that's some of the reason why maybe I'm here today talking about it as a pediatrician. It sure is. Uh, I mean, you were, you were ahead of the curve and still are ahead of the curve. Uh, and I think you're spot on for 
even being a pedi pediatrician, this this law itself may not impact your reimbursements, but they CMS and the federal agencies have been very clear that they expect that programs like this will be um, becoming more and more prevalent in Medicaid programs and, and even with um, private payers. And, and, and some of those changes we actually are seeing already. So yeah, yes. Absolutely. Um, I think last year, Andy Slavitt, when he came on board as CMS director, began immediately talking to states and looking at what they could do to Medicaid to see if they could come around to the same type of pay for performance programs that was introduced in MACRA. So this reality is real. Yes, definitely. And, and I think this is going to be a very timely discussion as well in that we are going to be seeing some pretty significant and drastic changes to Medicaid in general, um, I think, over the next few months and years. And this may be components of this that may be incorporated into some of those changes as well. So we're going to start out here uh, looking specifically at the um, changes made in the final rule. And, and as I mentioned before, I'm really going to be focusing more on that high level. What does the rule actually say? And then we will dig into some of the more practical implications of what that language actually means and whether it's feasible for clinicians to adopt those um, or, or likely realistic for them. Um, to, to be doing some of these activities. So the first component of the macro final rule that really has a direct impact on health equity is the clinical practice improvement activities section. And there were a number of changes that were made from the proposed rule to the final rule here, but, but basically what matters is what was published in the final rule, and that is that clinicians will have to report on either two high-weighted or four medium-weighted activities, and they will receive bonus points for performing certain activities that the, they use their um, health information technology, their electronic health records, to be able to report on. And those clinicians who are certified as patient-centered medical homes or work, or work in a patient-centered medical home, uh, they will receive 100% of that potential score for that component of the composite performance score, the clinical practice act improvement activity component. Um, and I think with regard to health equity, this, this category is really important in a number of ways. There are a lot of indirect ways that health equity is addressed um, in the eight different categories of clinical practice improvement activities. Uh, some examples of that indirect impact are population management. There are subcategories of that that look at uh, taking steps to improve healthcare disparities, working with their quality improvement organizations to do that, um, reviewing tar and targeting population needs according to uh, identifying those patients that may be more vulnerable to health disparities, and then tailoring clinical treatment needs um, according to what those findings are. And then there are also direct implications from the clinical practice improvement activities category in that the final rule adopted two categories that were, that were only proposed um, before. So the achieving health equity category and the integrated behavioral and mental health. And just a couple of small points about those. Um, some of those bonus points that I just discussed about using the electronic health records or, or health information technology to report screening for, for social determinants of health is one of those categories that clinicians can get bonus points for using, for reporting and, and collecting our screening for social determinants of health and reporting that in a clinical, uh, qualified clinical data registry. Um, and then with the integrated behavioral and mental health, um, co-locating mental health and substance use services in primary care settings and capturing behavioral health data in electronic health records are also some of those categories where they can get bonus points. And the 2015 certified EHR technology will actually provide fields, um, for the first time at least under the policy, eight fields to collect uh, domains of social and behavioral health data, and also sexual orientation and gender identity, 
which um, you know that's been an issue uh, very recently in the news with regard to the census and some changes potentially that have been been made around sexual orientation and gender identity in the census. But um, that will be moving forward in the um, electronic health record policy. So Dr. White just want to bring in some of the clinical perspective <clears throat> around some of these clinical practice improvement activities and whether they are activities that that you feel like clinicians may already be doing or how they might incorporate some of those activities practically or, or what challenges they might have in doing that? That's a large scope. I'll try to do my best to narrow that down. Um, Megan, I would say, first of all, that indeed the MACRA program that the government has instituted or passes a law, um, and as we read the rules, I think the goal is to improve quality for all Americans, which would definitely address disparities. Um, I guess it's the methodology, uh, the, the way that they have written those rules and the law that really needs to be looked at at the real world setting. Uh, I think when you look at the overview of the comments and the proposal and the rules, they read nicely, they, they, they are very um, idealistic, um, they seem to cover all the necessary elements that would go into providing the best for our citizens in America. But when it comes down to the real world and the, the clinicians' behavior and their activity and what happens on their level, it's totally different. And I think there's this sort of uh, disconnect sometimes between policy and reality. Um, and in the real world, this sounds great. I mean, it really sounds great. It looks great. And you say, this should work fine. But the real issue is that are doctors offices prepared to do all this? Is this something that we got in our training? Is this something that we're ready to just march out and do? And I would say the majority of doctors practices are not. I think that when you look at the uh, actual rule itself, and they actually studied it, that over, I guess, 600,000 or more uh, physicians will be impacted by MACRA. And of that, probably only about 75,000 to maybe 100 will perhaps get a positive score which means almost 85 to 80 percent of the physicians will not. That's that, that's scary. Uh, and, and that reality says, well, how are you going to pull this off? How are you really going to change and, and, and take care of equities and, and problems? Because physicians are going to be more focused on survival <laughs> than they are necessary on, on population outcomes. But having said that, I think there are people who have made a step to embrace this, uh, especially as you mentioned, the patient in medical homes. If individuals have been involved with becoming a patient in a medical home, as you saw on the, on the practice improvement activities, they're going to get 100% pass because they know, especially if you use NCQA uh, recognition, that you've had to prove that. You already understand what it means to go through process improvement. You already know what it means to measure. You already measured yourselves if you've gotten the recognition from NCQA. You've already submitted and done this. So for those individuals, they're saying you get a pass which you, this category is covered. Now, it's back to your health equities. If that's not one of the categories they chose to, to get their quality improvement in or the improvement activities in, there's not going to be any difference because basically, honestly, the practice is going to do the minimum that they have to do to pass and to get points and to get recognized. So it's, it, it's going to still fall on to the integrity of the physician to really still do something about disparities it's going to come down to the practice. At least there is a measuring tool now that says, well, if you do this, we might get some extra points. You might get something more. And you might be able, in the future one day, two years from now, you might actually get an improvement in your payment. Well, that's kind of pie in the sky for a doctor, but they might do it. I still hope that individuals who practice in that part of, the, uh, in that part of their communities or have those type of practices will do that, will actually, and help change some of these rates. But Will it make a big change in your overall picture? Maybe not, but we'd love for it to do so, but it might not. But I do want to put one word of caution out. I guess, again, doctors who have done meaningful use may have learned how to do some elements of quality reporting, not necessarily of improvement reporting. But the caveat I want to put out, especially if you're a practicing clinician, is that this may look like low-hanging fruit because there's only a few measures you have to comply with two or less, one if you're in a rural part of the country or you're in an underserved population, you only have to report on one improvement activity. Whereas this looks great, I have to tell you 
that you're going to be scrutinized with a very fine tooth cone and a, a very powerful microscope. And what I want to say to you in the, in the view of this is that you just can't say, wow, I measured this and look, I got better. You actually going to have to have meetings, documentation of minutes. You're going to have to have documentations of what process or program you put in place, whether you use Six Sigma or Lean or uh, PDSA or whatever you use, you're going to have to show your process of how you actually went through and determined how you're going to improve. Then you have to show how you measured and your outcomes, and that's going to be required, those minutes of those meetings. So you actually have to make sure <laughs> that you're just not going like, oh, my EHR does this, and I'll just kick out my numbers, and, and hey, guys, let's see if we improve. If we improve, let's report it. That's not going to work. And, uh, and I just want to make sure that caveat is understood that when you get down to the real world of how these things actually count, there's a lot of work involved. And I don't want that to be overlooked or for us to lose that in the policy talk that the real world, there's a lot of work going on. And that's in addition to what you've already done as a physician in your practice. So that's sort of my caveat. I hope I kind of put that together there, Megan. I can see a lot more, but I'll be, I'll be short and stop. No, I think, I think that you hit on a lot of really important points, and we will definitely flesh out some of those as we move forward. Um, and, and that's exactly why we're, we put these two pieces together today for this webinar, is so that we can highlight you know, what the policy itself looks like and how we can potentially leverage the policy to advance health equity, but understanding and recognizing that there are going to be a lot of moving parts to that and right. that cl different clinicians are moving on different timelines and some some with more resources and um, you know who have have been kind of one of those early adopters of technology that that Dr. White is um, you know they they may be a little bit more ahead of the game or prepared to document things and, and understand what this reporting is going to mean but then we're also going to have providers who fall under this program who did not do meaningful use right. and who have not adopted electronic health records right. and and you know maybe functioning on a shoestring budget and, and and providing excellent patient care but that may not be translated in the way that this program and system requires right. reporting and and they're looking at the possibility of being even penalized and getting less. Exactly. Um, and, and that's where the real pain reached the road is that sure we trying to achieve quality, but if you, you you'd rather be only incentivized and not necessarily punished in the field of medicine because we have so many other areas that we are being hit at to handle uh, and to be responsible for. And now you're going to say we're going to cut your payment if you don't meet all these different endeavors yet at the same time not getting increased payment to do it. <laughs> so let me just take a second to remind the audience, if you have any questions, please feel free to write those in the Q&A pod, and we will be addressing those um, as we move forward. We did also receive some questions uh, upon registration, and we have worked some responses to some of those questions into the presentation moving forward as well. Um, so the next piece that I want to talk about um, that potentially has a lot of impact on health equity that was part of MACRA is this quality piece. And we've talked a little bit about it and, and providers are required to report on uh, clinical quality measures. So they have hundreds of options of clinical quality measures to choose from, those that are relevant to their practice. Um, there are some that are, are more general that would be relevant to any uh, healthcare provider theoretically and then some of those that are more specific to different specialties. Um, but one of the issues that that we found was that the literature supports that these clinical quality measures should be stratified by race and ethnicity and other disparity variables if we are going to look at performance on on health disparities by using these clinical quality measures. And what we, you know, that was that was recommended in the um, public comment process, and the and CMS did address this in the final rule, but did not adopt requiring any stratification of any quality measures in the final rule. Um, 
And, and again, it, that this comes down to that issue of improving quality for all versus um, reducing health disparities. Okay. And it's one of those, if we don't know and we aren't looking at the data in that way, then we are not actually able to address that. And, and Dr. White and I had a, a discussion about the patient-centered medical home and again kind of being ahead of the curve and 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 doing things like this stratification and I'm going to hand it over to him to talk a little bit about how that can look in the quality program. I believe certification ONC certification for 2014 EHRs required that ethnicities racial databases were in place. Now how every EHR vendor allowed you to sort of query or sort by those particular parameters. The majority of them did, do or did because that's just a piece of data now that you collected. You should be able to sort by it. So the capacity to do it if you have 2014 um, uh, certified EHRs is present. It may not be sitting there on your dashboard as a button you click and you get that that way, but you can certainly do the queries and obtain the data because the data is, 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 is in place. Um, in, in our uh, patient-centered medical home, which uh, the NCQA recognized practices that of us who, who chose to go that route, they uh, really encouraged that we would look at things in that direction. Matter of fact, it was one of the uh, measures where you could get percentage points if you reported your process improvement by looking at disparities and things of that nature. And um, so therefore, if you did get a PCMH recognition, you may have already done this in your practice. If you haven't, it certainly is something that's very valuable. It's an extremely valuable tool that will help you in, your, in reporting your quality, whether or not it's required or not. Now, coming back to the reality of macro and, its quali and those qualified measures, you know, I, I think, as I said, they have over 600 that you can choose from. You have to be very specific to your practice, to, to your population. Again, you have the choice to choose at least six, I believe it is, uh, and if you're going to report, or 15 if you're going to do a full year report. Uh, if you do just 90 days, it's, I think it's six. Um, I think it warrant if I just pause for a moment and say that in your reporting, you cannot report and, and accept the penalty in 2019, or you can just test and right. say I have. We're going to get to okay. some of those so, uh, in a little so, bit. So, yep. so if I'm by giving the answer, I don't want to overlook the fact that we're talking about a special portion of how macro is, uh, is, is implemented. But, and, 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 and going back to the point of when you choose those quality measures, I think for those who have done MU, they will understand very clearly what it means to have numerators and denominators. And if you have done this, you also may recognize that probably, I don't know of anyone who has the same numerator and denominators that was ascribed to you as what you have. It's a major disparity there as far as in real reporting what they have on you and what you have. In macro, your new raters and denominators have to be spot on. <laughs> and not many people are prepared for that. And, and that's how you have to report to get an accurate percentage report to file for your quality and to have it recognized and approved. <laughs> so it's going to have to be something verifiable and it's going to have to be real data, and you're going to have to have it almost errorless. There is a big problem there, because that is a hurdle that hasn't been achieved yet with meaning for use reporting. So how is it going to happen in macro where you bring in people who have never done this before? It's going to be a nightmare. So a lot of people thinking, I got my report, I did my quality, and they're going to find a disappointment that it didn't measure up. It wasn't valid. It wasn't real. It was not acceptable. So. This is back again to the application of MACRA versus the policy of MACRA. Uh, and the application standpoint of view, you really need to be on top of this. So when you pick your areas, you need to study them hard, bring in your, your, your people to know what they're doing, and you're going to have to make sure EHR vendor is getting your information correctly and that the data input is being inputted correctly because the data is only as good as the input. EHR can have everything there, but if the input is not correct, it's still going to be a problem. So I do want to make sure that in, in, in when the clinician evaluates this, that they understand that the numerator and denominator is everything in the quality report. It's literally everything. So if I would throw a little curveball to Megan, I'm probably going to get in trouble, but I would say this much to you on, on, on that particular curveball. <laughs> 
that when it comes to being evaluated and getting your points, and therefore hopefully getting enough points to get a positive outcome so you'll get an increase in 2019, when you have to go through all this and, and, and achieve this for your reporting, I, it's, it's sad that you won't know anything until after report is submitted. And that's the real pain. You can go through all this and you will not know till after March 31st, 2018, before they send you back how they reviewed you, what it meant, and give you the real targets that you thought you were getting. Right. And you may be set Let's up for this Let's remind the um, listeners, too, of, of what that timeline is. So right. the reporting period actually started January 1st of 2017, That's right? Correct. So those clinicians who are ready to start reporting were able to start January 1st, 2017. Now, again, we will talk a little bit more about the different the flexibility <laughs> that the agency incorporated into reporting for right. this first year um, with the final rule. Um, but then the penalties or adjustments, sorry, penalties or, um, yes, that <laughs> starts in January of 2019, That's right. correct? So right. what you're saying here is that potentially physician, clinicians are starting to report now and they will not know how they're performing, aka whether their payment will be adjusted positively or negatively or not at all, until March of 2018. Until so after March. Maybe. Until after March of 2018, and then those adjustments will go into effect in 2019. That's correct. Okay. So what you're saying here is the challenges for the kind of blind reporting yes. at this point. And that's why I emphasize, make sure your numerators and denominators are dead on. And you can argue and you got the documentation to support and, and, and show your due diligence. You really need to keep almost like all your work papers together so, so that you, nothing is overlooked because they'll give you some time to look at these reports in the latter part of 2018 before 2019 implication starts. But you got to be ready to fight. <laughs> well, and it sounds like any adjustments that clinicians might want to make given their performance scores that they find out in after March of 2018 right. wouldn't actually affect the adjustments until probably 2020 right. potentially. Right. The, um, so they would potentially be living for that yep. year with the adjustments that they didn't know right. until then. For a whole full year. Now you made a good point earlier though as well that just because this is the way the policy is laid out right now doesn't necessarily mean that there won't be changes there will be changes. Exactly. It, 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 they actually know that it will be changes. And hopefully it's it will be to make up for what will be the deficits because I think there's going to be a significant blow. And it's going to be a significant pain to a lot of people who've actually done a lot of hard work and they realize they may not have gotten what they thought they were getting. Uh, and, and, and that's that, that's the whole thing that hurts the most about this is that while we try to encourage us to meet disparities and be better clinicians, in, a, in another way we're looking at having to do this without any increased reimbursement and still have to add this extra overhead and then not know an outcome <coughs> and we're going to get paid for a year off of that outcome, that can be discouraging. Um, and again, that's why I take that view that I have. I'm doing it for the patients. <laughs> I have to take that view because if I, I might be so disappointed on the other side of the picture, but we have to keep our heads above water because the field of medicine must go on. We still got to be there for the patients no matter what. Great. So we've talked a little bit about the impact of MACRA on small and rural practices yes. and providers serving in health professional shortage areas. Um, I wanted to at least start out with addressing some of the actual provisions in the final rule and then you, I invite you to um, again talk a little bit practically about what that means. So there were some changes that were made in the final rule to accommodate small rural and HIPSA providers um, given that there was a lot of concern in the public comments. Uh, very in line with some of the concerns that you're expressing right now, that this is had the potential to be a program to cripple and or put some of those small rural practices out of 
out of business, yes. Um, so some of those changes were flexibility in reporting for 2017, mm -hmm. um, which you mentioned, and, and we'll actually show a table on the next slide of what those um, categories look like. Uh, there were program, there's a program exemption for low volume. Um, so for clinicians who, who provide less than $30,000 in claims for Medicare um, beneficiaries in a year, they would now be exempt mm -hmm. from the program. Um, which in the final rule, CMS um, puts forth that that represents a, approximately 32.5% of all clinicians, or 380,000. So, you know, that is a, a much more significant cut than the proposed rule, which was a, a $10,000 limit. Right. So, right. so a pretty significant change there. Um, as you also mentioned, uh, there were some relaxed reporting requirements for the advancing care information and clinical mm -hmm. practice improvement activities for those clinicians falling into small rural and HIPSA categories. They can submit one clinical practice improvement activity mm -hmm. to get partial credit or two for full. Mm -hmm. um, and then there is $100 million in technical assistance that uh, was provided in the legislation itself. Um, and has now the, the I, I think this is going to actually go through the quality improvement organizations and these small rural and health professional shortage area providers can get this assistance through their quality improvement organizations. Now that may look different yeah. um, from state to state. Right. But um, the, the last piece that um, I don't, whether this was a change for the final rule, I'm not sure, but um, FQHCs, federally qualified health centers and rural health centers um, are exempt from MACRA in general. Um, so any services that are billed under their all-inclusive payment methods are not subject to MIPS adjustment. But if they are providing services that are paid under the physician fee schedule, then those will be subject to MIPS. Now, in, in true um, government fashion, they also encourage clinicians in those settings to voluntarily report under the program. Um, and there, there was some discussion in the public comments about whether any FQHCs or, or rural health care or health center providers would actually take them up on that and voluntarily report. Um, but yeah, we'll go to the next slide with the flexibility in reporting for 2017. And um, if you just want to um, give some the, the, feedback that on was, this. That was added as far as the final rule. Because okay. it, when I say added, it wasn't really, really discussed in the proposed rule. So it was added by private because of comments from the FQ, right. FQCs. OK, so. OK. Um, so I think it looks like from the, and, and these, these options were not a part of the proposed rule either. Initially, it was basically you have to report starting January 1st, 2017, full year. Full year. Um, so, and this this provides a few options. Uh, basically, the takeaway is report something. Right. right. Right, so that you don't get the negative payment adjustment. The only way that you will get a negative payment adjustment is if you do not report any data in 2017. Right. Um, so, there are, are uh, those couple of options there. Um, and well, let's move on to the technology, because that plays okay. into some of the reporting as well. And, and as I mentioned, um, Dr. White, you are an early adopter mm -hmm. of electronic health records. When did you say you? 1995. 1995. So um, as, as we said initially, the advancing mm -hmm. care information category of MACRA is formerly the Meaningful Use Program. Now, it has changed quite a bit, but a lot of the essential elements there are the same. Um, there were some changes in the final rule that the uh, reporting on 11 different measures, that was reduced to five. Um, there is a bonus for reporting quality measures via the electronic health record. Um, participation in a health information exchange constitutes a clinical practice improvement activity. And conducting telemedicine constitutes a clinical practice improvement activity. All of these um, having a pretty significant potential impact on health equity in, at least for telemedicine, increasing access to services that 
uh, patients may not have access to or would have to travel long distances to receive. Um, and then participa participation in the health information exchange at that theoretical level um, improves care coordination and would potentially reduce redundant testing right. and those kinds of things. Um, but I know, and I'm hoping that you're about to tell us, uh, practically about participating in health information exchanges, especially in non-metropolitan areas in a state like Georgia. Um, I know you have had some experience, experience there and, and with uh, regard to telemedicine as well. Oh, yes. Uh, kind of hit both of those subjects. First of all, we are very fortunate in the state of Georgia that our Georgia Health Information Network is probably one of the top states as far as an um, uh, integrated uh, health information exchange. Um, and uh, it has quite a, a growth rate as far as participation in the exchange. For those in rural America, it still would be very difficult because it really hits more of the metropolitan areas, and that's correct. However, in our state, we have what we call service area HIEs which are smaller health information exchanges. Usually a hospital is involved with a group of physicians in, 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 in their local communities. Uh, many of these health, exchange, health exchanges, or at least I know one particular one, but I know others too, recognize that rural America is being sort of left out. And many of these service area health information exchanges will reach out to you, even if you're in another part of the state, and they will bring you on board if you really want to become part of the uh, the total Georgia Health Information Network. So in the state of Georgia, that's a great low-hanging fruit. fruit. You, if you have an EHR and you want to be a part of the Georgia Health Information Network, you can get a hold of a service area HIE. All you need to do is call GHIN and ask, and they can have somebody contact you, and you can get hooked up. You can also get hooked up what we call direct messaging, which is just a, a secure health information email address. And that also works as a, a, a connection within the Health Information Network. And you can get that without becoming part of the Health Information Exchange. You can just, of, of a local one, you can just join the general GN with a direct messaging and you'll be able to transmit information back and forth. Uh, the difficulty with that, just as a caveat, is you need to have somebody else on it to send it to. <laughs> so that's why it's a little bit more difficult than it would be if you were just in a uh, health information service area. So that kind of covers that. When it comes down to telemedicine, again, we are very fortunate in Georgia that we have a very powerful Georgia tele telemedicine uh, network here in this state. And I know they're very prominent all over the state, especially in, in the southern uh, part of Georgia. And uh, becoming involved with them may not be that difficult, but there is other ways you can do it. Um, and that's what's so neat. Right now, because MACRA has done this, this has been a proliferation across the nation in telehealth medicine applications, local apps on your smartphones and local things set up in your office. And I had a chance to look at one that you can do it just between your own patients and your practice. You don't have to do it with another practice. You can actually give your patients sort of like, you want to be a, you know, a star patient or a high quality patient, I'll give you a local time. If you're out in, in Timbuktu or somewhere because of your you know, the fact that you're a good patient and you've met all my criteria, I'll give you telemedicine. You can just call me up and go through your app and I can see you and, and take care of your needs that way. And there's a lot of applications out there that do that. So important policy right. consideration for that, though, is whether you're going to get reimbursed for that time as the physician. Uh, actually, with this, with this app in your office, you get to charge like a regular office visit. Okay. And that is that is cleared and is not a problem. It's It meets... Your, your CMS criteria, as well as meeting your uh, local, most insurance agencies will pay for it, and you Great. can charge as a regular office visit. Great. So one other takeaway with the health IT that I really just, I heard from you kind of messaging throughout, um, and it's really working with your electronic health record vendor. Right. Right. And Absolutely. this is MACRA, and the requirements around MACRA are really that opportunity, I'm going to call it an opportunity, um, for clinicians to take advantage of working with the vendor. There are going to be a lot of things that clinicians are going to need their health IT and their EHRs to perform. And according to some of what we've discussed, the certified electronic health record technology should be performing it. And this is really that clinicians may, may need to, to 
make sure that's happening. I think that more clinicians should talk to the HR vendors, uh, at least to the local vendor that may be selling the product, if not the national vendor. Uh, I think it's very important because it, it, it allows for the vendors to see what their population is really, what their, what, what their problems are and how to maybe adjust and answer because most national vendors produce a product based upon what they have surveyed and gotten from the majority of the people that have spoken to them. This is the answer, but it may not necessarily work for you in your area. And it can be quite expensive trying to pay for all these customization on your own. So you want to do more on a, on a, on a big level for that. I do want to throw one caveat out there. I'm sorry again, but there is a problem. There's a little bit of delayed disconnect because the, 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 the rules for requiring EHR to reach the 2015 quote unquote <coughs> certification are not complete yet, but yet MACRA is in effect. So, right. so you, right. you, you, those you, requirements <laughs> go into effect in 2018. That's right. Yet so MACRA is, is 2017. Right. So you're stuck with 2014 uh, certification and you might not be able to do a lot of the things that are there because it requires 2015. And again, you kind of caught behind a little eight ball because you're up now to how advanced was your vendor? <laughs> Did right. they have foresight to have something in place that you could use? Good point. Uh, yeah. So. so if anyone has questions, please, again, I'll remind you, put them in the um, Q&A pod. But we're really going to address our last question for the discussion here. Um, and that is, how might macro change given the current political environment? We've been seeing a lot of public discourse. Uh, last week, we looked at potential um, repeal and replace of the Affordable Care Act. And then it looked like that wasn't going to happen. And then already Monday and Tuesday, that was back on the agenda. So you know, there's a lot of fluctuation here. I really want you to answer this question. The only Things I'm going to say are just highlighting that the Affordable Care Act and MACRA are two separate pieces of legislation. Correct. There is no indication, we haven't heard anything about changes to MACRA or repealing of MACRA. And to what you pointed out at the beginning of this, it was bipartisan support. Yep. And that, you know, the potential in my, in my view is that some of the um, Models that are being incentivized by MACRA, the Accountable Care Organizations, the Shared Savings Program, and CMMI were all created um, or codified, at least, by the Affordable Care Act. Exactly. So if that is gone, that <laughs> may have some implications, but your, your feedback and comments there. Well, being a policy expert that you are, you obviously see the, <laughs> the, the, the sort of disconnect because Almost everything macro is based upon, especially your quality measures and all your measures, actually are birthplace out of the, the Affordable Care Act. Uh, those organizations are birthplace out of the Affordable Care Act. So I think many people misunderstood the Affordable Care Act and got caught up with what the media has produced, which is the insurance piece. That's only a small portion of it, but yet it got overemphasized that everybody thought that's what Obamacare was. And they missed the fact that it was really a patient bill of rights. and quality pushing and the physician's response to how we had to meet these quality pushes. It saved all of the EHR development. So in one aspect of it, to throw that away, it doesn't make sense. Perhaps that's why it didn't go through <laughs> because there's too much embedded into what MACRA is. And I do not believe that the federal government will go back on MACRA because it's a balanced act. It, it is a budget neutral act. <laughs> It is kind of a act, gift and a curse. It, right. Right? It's a gift and a curse in that one statement, and I won't elaborate on it. But the, the perspective of this is that this is something that is saving Congress from having to deal with on a yearly basis what to do with Medicare. So to get rid of that would be like reversing everything you've done and going back to how you take care of the nation's health, especially the Medicare population. So I don't think MACRA is going anywhere, and yet MACRA is directly tied to the Affordable Care Act in so many areas. Its, it's, it's tentacles are so thick right. that it, you can't separate the two, but yet at the same time, there are two different entities. As a result of that, what is the future of it? MACRA is here to stay. Fee for service is gone, folks. It's gone. Pay for performance is in. The insurance companies are excited about it. They have gone faster than MACRA at, at developing models for pay for performance because Wow, if I can measure you, determine how to pay you, that's a that's a that's a golden shoot parachute for the insurance 
industry. And I don't want to be too cynical in saying, poor doctors, we have to watch what's happening, but it's kind of too late. Um, it's in place. So, well, and it sounds to me like your message with that is physicians need to engage in the policy making process. As and, much as and they can. I understand the practical barriers to that. Um, but, you know, maybe that's an area that the physician community that we're, we're um, you know, focusing on, we can, we can talk about how what we're finding, what you guys are experiencing, and what impact that has on health equity. I think, I think that... medical schools need to place that as part of the curriculum. I think the idea of how to be involved in a real political world that affects you needs to be taught to doctors in training. And I can tell you that many medical schools are now doing that. Even here in Georgia, the physicians every year meeting a legislative day where we go there and medical students are at our meetings right. from all the medical schools there. And they're learning. You have to know your politician. you got to know them, get to have a relationship with them and not just expect the world to be taking care of you. You need to be responsible for your own health. That is financially. Right. <laughs> right. Okay, well, we are out of time for this discussion um, and going to hand it over um, to conclude. All right, thank you so much, Megan. And we'd like to thank everyone for joining today's presentation. We hope that you found it to be an enjoyable learning experience. Um, please um, feel free to download the presentation as well as some other resources that are available for you to access now in the files pod. That's the pod that's just below the presentation. Um, we would also like to send a special thank you to our speakers today, Ms. Megan Douglas and Dr. White, for providing such valuable information. Their contact information is on the screen, so please feel free to reach out to them with any questions, um, additional questions you may have about today's topic. Again, today's presentation was brought to you by the National Center for Primary Care at Morehouse School of Medicine, a national resource for supporting primary care professionals serving in underserved areas. And we do have one final reminder before you go about an upcoming webinar on May 3rd, so please join us for that exciting discussion. We also want to get your feedback about today's presentation, so check your email later today. We're going to send you an evaluation so we can uh, figure out how we can better serve you in the future. And thanks again, everyone, for joining today's presentation. We hope you have a great afternoon. Thank you.